All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to our career conversations with um, Ty Tomasi. Uh, welcome. And as people are filling into the room, I'm going to run a poll to see who all is joining us um, tonight. Um, and by the way, my name is Olaya Landa Villard. I am the director of the APH Connect Center. And so I'm happy to uh, be here tonight with you all and um, happy to be able to share um, Ty's um, background and experiences and just have a lot of fun. So um, I'm going to start this poll really quickly here. Um, we want to know what your job title is. Are you a teacher of students with visual impairments? Are you a low vision specialist? Are you an orientation and mobility specialist, a vision rehab specialist or teacher, assistive technology specialist, college faculty or state administration, student in a college program, a parent or other? And if you find yourself in the other category, please enter that into the chat. Um, if uh, Where are you from? Are you from the Northeast US, Southeast US, Northwest US, Southwest US, Midwest US? Alaska, Hawaii, U.S. territory, Canada, European country, or other. And again, if you find yourself in the other category, please enter that into the chat. And how did you hear about this webinar? Email from APH, APH website, university faculty, social media, ACV REP website, a friend or colleague, or other. Okay. So I'm going to end the poll. And I'm gonna share the results and let's see who we have here. So we have about 20% of our audience are uh, teachers of students with visual impairments. Uh, another 20% vision rehab specialist, therapist or teacher and 60% find themselves in the other category. Um, and let's see, we have about 20% from the Northeast US. We don't have anybody from Southeast, Northwest US. Um, we have 80% uh, of us are from the Southwest US. Uh, we don't have anybody from the Midwest, nobody from Alaska, Hawaii, U.S. Territory, Canada, European country, or other. 80% um, of you guys heard about us from an email from APH and 20% from a friend or colleague. So it uh, looks like our emails are really working and getting it out, getting the word out. So, um, you know, keep, uh, pass, our, pass our emails along <laughs> so we can let other people know about all the awesome things we're doing. Okay. So now I'm stopping sharing the results and I will hand it over to Richard and Ty. All right, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Richard Reda, Digital Content Manager with Career Connect with the APH Connect Center. Uh, and we've got our colleagues, uh, Alaya and Katie on with us, helping out with the chat feature. Uh, Career Conversations is our monthly offering through Career Connect where we allow um, job seekers, those interested in careers and just learning about how blind people do their jobs and do their jobs well from all walks of life. Um, I've got a puppy right here next to me who's just moving around, sorry for the noise. Uh, and we, um, we're, we're, we do this every month at the first Thursday of each month and we invite you uh, to write in your questions uh, the first 15 minutes of, or so of each interview um, hour. We'll, I'll interview the guest and then we'll ask you all to put your questions in the chat. And if you do want to uh, ask a question and uh, under the microphone, we can make that happen as well. Uh, again, we are pleased to be doing this. This is our third career conversations and we plan on doing it throughout the year, almost every month. And uh, in April, we have Kyron Kaja who works in accessibility with Instagram. He will be on with us April the 7th. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of meeting and getting to know more about Ty Tomasi. She is the director of, I got this Ty, Accessibility, Belonging, Inclusion, Diversity and Equity here with the American Printing House for the Blind. Um, I have known Ty on and off <clears throat> for a little over 20, 21 years when I believe I first met her at a, at a conference, a blindness conference uh, through scholarships and student networking. And I think our careers have intersected uh, several times over the past two decades. And uh, it's great to see colleagues who are blind, who are low vision, who are doing things awesome and amazing and just thriving out there. It gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome you, Ty, to Career Conversations. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. Could you start out by telling us a little bit about yourself and what does it mean to be the director of Abide, Accessibility, Belonging, Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity with APH? 
So I was born blind. Uh, I was born prematurely and I grew up in attending public schools. I'm from a very large family of all adopted children. So I got a lot of exposure to um, hanging out with my siblings and doing lots of outdoor activities, um, things like that, and doing sports um, and getting involved in adaptive sports and things like that. Um, I studied political science in college. Um, I used Braille growing up and I used computers growing up. So I had a screen reader. Um, I did learn how to read large print, but it turned out it was not the solution for me because the, as the print got smaller, I got more headaches. So I ended up switching over to Braille and screen readers exclusively, um, using those all through school and then college. Um, and I went to get a master's in public administration. I was hoping to combine those two with, I was hoping to combine that with a law degree. And um, my school said, well, you applied for this program, but you didn't apply for the other one. So you have to do one at a time. So I did that master's in public administration. I was thinking about going into, uh, maybe city planning or other kinds of administrative jobs. Um, they also had a concentration in nonprofits, so I learned a lot about nonprofit work. Um, and I ended up having to um, get into the workforce as soon as I could because I needed to be able to support myself after the death of a loved one. Um, so I ended up going to work in the blindness field, uh, working in the transition area, so working with blind youth, um, helping them get jobs in their communities. And I had to put law school off for a little while for that reason, to be able to be financially sufficient uh, and self-sustaining. So I did that for a few years. I really enjoyed um, working with blind youth and being an employment specialist, um, helping people get jobs in their communities and get job experience, and doing all the associated trainings and camps, um, working with students, working with parents, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I guess how I became, how I got involved with Abide uh, coming on to APH was kind of a circuitous route and I'll get into that a little bit more. Sure. I can go into more detail of those, but um, what does it mean to be um, in Abide? All of the jobs that I've done, um, all the jobs that I just spoke about, all the education that I spoke about in all of those arenas, I was interested in accessibility. Um, I was always advocating for inclusion and making sure that uh, we talked about diversity in all of its forms, not just in racial diversity. Um, I noticed a lot of diversity programs are about racial diversity, and that's very important, but we also need to talk about disability and accessibility and belonging and equity and all of those different concepts. And so all through school and all through my career in its winding path um, and all through my advocacy, those have been really important issues. Um, starting from when I was very young and didn't know how to advocate, um, I, I went to a diving class and was told I couldn't be a diver because I was blind. Um, the next thing that happened, I went to go get a job and I was, I dressed up as a crab in a crab costume and I was 15 years old. That was my very, very first job. And I was told that, um, I couldn't do that job because it was unsafe for a blind person. And I literally thought if I can't be a crab, what am I going to do with my life? Because this is like, to me as a 15 year old, like that was what, one of the, like, I, I perceived it as like, this is like the lowest kind of job you could do. And that's not, that's not a fair assessment, but at that time, that's what I thought. Like, this is yeah. like the easiest job I could do. Right. So if I can't do that job, nobody's going to let me do it. What am I going to do? And so I kind of fell into a depression there and I, and I came out of it wanting to advocate. And that's how I kind of started my lifelong love of advocacy and making sure people understand what it means to be included, what it means to have accessible jobs, what it means to have accessible education um, what, what it means to be inclusive and help people feel like they're welcome. That's really, really cool. So tell us more, a little bit more about your current role. What do you do? What are your, some of your day-to-day -day responsibilities? How do you influence APH and other people in the field and other groups, committees, and, and, and so on to, to be mindful, respectful, and thoughtful about Abide? So there's quite a few different things that I do. I work internally with all different departments. So I get to collaborate with a lot of different people on helping uh, helping them make our, our organization as inclusive as possible, as welcoming as possible. And that's taken a lot of different forms, particularly now that we're doing a lot of remote work, making sure remote employees are included and that they have everything that they need. Um, and then it also goes to our programs. You know, How do we make sure that everything we do externally is very accessible? Um, and then internally, how do we make sure our manufacturing area is accessible as possible um, and can allow blind and visually impaired people to work all the jobs? So at the moment, we're working on 
making sure that all of our systems are accessible. So our technology systems, we have quite a few different types of systems we need. We have finance software, we have HR, human resources software. There's all different kinds of software. And we wanna make sure that we choose the most accessible systems we can. Now, as an accessibility advocate, I've learned you know, there isn't always an accessible option. So what happens to our company when that happens? Then we have to advocate with other companies who are making the software to ask them to um, make sure that they're using accessibility standards to make that software accessible. The same goes for every other kind of um, issue we might have, whether it's with software or the built environment. You know, we're getting ready to undertake a building renovation. So we're talking about how we make that very accessible. Um, how do we make APH much more accessible because our building is old and it's been cobbled together several times. There's, so there's different levels in our building where there's different stairs. And so when we renovate it, we can fix some of those and make, make the building more accessible. So um, it's a very wide ranging job. Um, I have a lot of contact with the community. I'm doing a lot of community outreach to talk to agencies for the blind, um, community organizations in Louisville where we are located to talk to them about making their facilities more accessible. Right now we're talking with the botanical gardens about how they can make their facility accessible as they plan it. Um, also interfacing with the transportation agencies in the area to make sure that they have uh, make things as accessible as possible. Um, and then working with other organizations um, about around equity and diversity in the community. That's just I, it in a nutshell. There's a lot more, but that's oh, a, no. a 10,000 foot overview of what's going on. And I do have some follow-up questions on what you just mentioned, but I do sure. want to remind our audience, again, welcome to Career Conversations. Um, we do this monthly. If you have questions, uh, go ahead and start putting those in the chat. In about five minutes, we'll have Katie uh, let us know if there are questions. Uh, anything goes, really. Just We want to interview uh, Ty, a uh, good opportunity to network and learn about what does it mean to do what she does, having been an attorney. Ty, when you mentioned about influencing the building uh, renovation for accessibility, um, what have you found or have you identified other businesses, other organizations in the United States that are like, wow, this is great. I want, I want us to be like them as far as building standards. Are there other are places, maybe like the Ed Roberts campus here in the uh, Berkeley area or, or other agencies? Yeah, I think, I think the Ed Roberts campus is a good example of uh, you know, the best practices for independent living, making sure everything's really accessible. And then also um, places like the San Francisco Lighthouse have been a great example. Yes. Um, and there is a great blind architect who worked with them called Chris Downey, and he did a great job. Um, I know we've consulted with him about um, some of our architecture um, in the beginning stages. And um, we're focusing a little bit on, you know, how can we use sound, for example, in the design of our new areas? How can we use sound in the museum to, to indicate, you know, different acoustics where you are located? Um, how can we use environmental cues? How can we use changes in flooring that are um, designed for it to, to be um, attractive and, and functional for everyone? So um, it's just kind of gathering that kind of knowledge wherever we can find it in the community. And there are a lot of great examples, but those are just a couple I can think of. And let me ask, and thank you, <clears throat> pardon me, one more question for now. Um, growing up as a blind uh, person, young adult, what, did you have mentors or model, role models that you looked up to? And, and what was that like for you? What, what, did you have many, none? And, and what were those experiences like? Yeah, so once I decided uh, I was going to try to figure out how to get out of that funk after I got terminated from my very first job, I started contacting a lot of blind students who were doing a lot of different things. And it was great to get in touch with them. And they served as wonderful mentors to get me to do things that I never thought I could do. They, they said, hey, get on the train and meet us down in D.C. We'll go advocate on Capitol Hill. Hey, let's go do this other thing. Um, and that kept happening over and over. And then as I did those things, I was introduced to blind and visually impaired lawyers who were doing the work that I wanted to do. Um, in DC and elsewhere, um, even in my local community, there were some. Uh, so just learning about that there were blind lawyers that they could successfully do the job, um, it really got me interested in the law. And so I ended up, um, you know, pursuing that degree in political science, doing that degree in public administration. Um, one thing I will say was that I was very afraid to go to law school. I was terrified of law school because it was built up in so many ways that it's so hard and it's so difficult and it's terrifying. And if you watch movies about law school, you see the terror in the students faces when they're like trying to take getting ready for their exams and like there's just a lot of stress and a lot of pressure and it's very competitive and so I was very scared to start um, and so one of the things that I think is really important to think about is 
um, you know, we got to kind of work through that fear a little bit. And so I think that one of my kind of mantras that I go by is like, action conquers fear. Like if you are afraid to start, just start, even if it's scary, um, one little step at a time, because I, I think that's one of my regrets. I wish I'd gone to law school a little bit sooner. Um, but I was really, I was terrified to do it. And once I got a job, I was just, oh, I'll just keep doing this job. And it was a great job. I've enjoyed every job that I've done. I've learned so much from it. I've enjoyed it. But I do wish I hadn't let the fear kind of hold on to me a little bit, a little bit longer than I would like. So being surrounded by peers who are doing things really helped build that confidence and influence. It really did. It really did. As I, as I went along, as I met more attorneys, um, you know, I didn't, that fear went away. And as I took action, you know, I said, Hey, I'm going to do this. I'm really committed to it. I'm going to meet these folks. We're going to talk about how they're doing their jobs and that fear subsided. And that's what I mean by taking action in some way to kind of build up your confidence and start to move toward your goal, whatever that goal is. So if you could speak to your 18 year old self watching this video right now, you know, 20 years ago or whatever the case might be, what would your advice be to that person? I think it would be, uh, you know, finding try to find mentors as much as you can um, get in, in touch with your community. Um, you can certainly start by reaching out to local groups and getting names of people that you can talk to because that will bolster your confidence when you find someone else who's doing similar things that you can, that you want to do and you start taking action, you know, you follow the path that they kind of recommend for you. Not that you have to do it as, just as they say it, but just, you know, some steps, here's some steps that you can do to get ready for this. Um, that will really ease your mind in huge ways. And then another thing that I would tell myself is um, excellence does not require perfection. Like sometimes I would try to, I would procrastinate things because I wanted to make it perfect. And then it would, you know, procrastination is tough. Then you have to do it all overnight. You have to pull it all nighter to get it done. Sure. <laughs> um, so don't let perfection keep you from, uh, from starting something and from moving forward with it. Uh, this is great. Thank you. Uh, let me ask Katie, do we have any uh, questions in the chat yet? We do. We have someone asking um, if you have heard of EDG Guide, and I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but that's how it appears to me on my Braille display. Um, that's, it's used in libraries that helps people who are blind or have low vision um, locate things. Yeah, I've actually heard of this before. And I think one of my local libraries in another town that I lived in was was looking at using that. I'm not really I'm not familiar with it firsthand, but it definitely sounded like it was a helpful resource. Um, I know that we have our own um, kind of uh, sister company, Good Maps, that's kind of doing similar work with indoor navigation, which is really helpful. Yeah. So there's a lot of great initiatives out there that are really helping to make indoor navigation a little bit easier, which is really nice. I'm really excited to learn more about good maps at the upcoming CSUN conference and, and just utilizing that to be as fiercely independent as possible. So, good, but I would good. love to check it out firsthand sometime. If you know of a library where it is, I would love to hear that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Are anything else in the chat, Katie? Not right now, but again, this is yes. your time folks not to be shy and bashful, please. Anything you want to ask Ty in her role um, as a director of accessibility belonging Inclusion. I always want to say integrity, <laughs> but inclusion belongs. Integrity is good, uh, also. But yeah, yeah, inclusion, <laughs> diversity, <laughs> and equity. Uh, let me ask you this question, Ty. So, being in the role that you're in now as, as a by diversity and equity and inclusion, it, it's a relatively new role. We're, we're seeing a lot more about hearing a little more about this in in the community, not just the blindness community, but everywhere. Um, what is, where do you go to define your role and how, do, what are best practices? Like who, do you network with other abide people out there and, and what does that look like? Yeah, there are quite a few organizations that do a lot with diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I'm noticing that as I attend different conferences and things on this, in this area, uh, like I said earlier, sometimes they're more limited than they need to be. They don't talk about accessibility as much. Yeah. Um, they might talk more about racial equity, which is very important, but we also need to broaden it to include um, all disability groups. So I am interested in learning more. There's a lot on LinkedIn. Um, there's so much information now. It's kind of an exploding industry, and it actually makes it hard to kind of call the information because there's so much out there. Yeah. And not all of it is aligned with APH's mission because it needs to really be focused on accessibility at the core. Um, all of those things stem, you know, you can't have 
an equitable or inclusive program if you if it's not accessible. And so I'm a, a, an outspoken advocate with other organizations who are doing this work um, about that. And I have been trying to locate some other consultants and strategists who are like minded in that, who have lived experience or who just who know more about disability and kind of incorporate that into their into their work as well. Well, it must be awesome that you do when you do the, these networking opportunities with others in the in, in the field, you get to pick not you get to not look at what's not in alignment with your mission, but you get to go, hey, that's a cool thought, that's a cool idea. I, I think we should adopt that, or I'm I'm going to bring this to APH and see how we can integrate this whatever this is into our mission, our values, and into our systems. Yeah, in fact, um, someone else. There was another organization that had. Bide, which is the the last four letters of our acronym, and I saw that, and I was like, oh well, we can add accessibility and make it abide. So I mean, we're always learning from each other and learning um, how how other people are doing this work, and um, you know, even as even as simple as something as something as simple as an acronym is a learning experience as well. And like you said, you get to influence other communities, like the um, uh, the uh, you mentioned it in Louisville, the Garden Place, the, um, the yeah, yeah, the Botanical River Botanical, Botanical Garden yeah, is one of them, right. and then we're going to be working with others as they come along, um, and we get a lot of inquiries from different places around the country. Um, one of them was the oh, what was it? Let me think. Oh, the AP, the Associated Press, wrote to us and said, "Hey, let's talk about how we talk about disability in our articles." And so they were doing a new style guide, and they wanted our advice. So we get a lot of inquiries like that. I got one from the National Park Service. They wanted to know, um, are there standards about how raised uh, raised lines are made? Do they need to be domed? Can they be squared off? And so you know, it's interesting. Every day is a new challenge to learn um, because I don't know all that stuff off the top of my head. I have to go research it a little bit. And that's where my research skills come in handy um, or and all my contacts in different networking um, have come in handy to, to talk to people who would know the answers to those. Certainly we have a lot of in, internal knowledge at APH, but we don't have all those answers for every single inquiry we get. And so life is never dull and it's very interesting to, to help um, everyone with all of those different questions. Um, and we even talk to you know blindness agencies, residential programs. How can residential programs navigate issues around gender identity when sometimes you know people involved in those the parents in those organizations or parents of children in those programs have questions? So you know there's always different questions to be to be discussed, and it all goes back to um, you know respecting the dignity of everyone and making sure we respect every different every different identity that that we talk with and that, that presents itself. And Katie, I think there was another one question that just got popped in the chat. Yes, um, so we have um, some good discussion here about, um, you know, leaving out diversity and inclusion of low vision people um, mm -hmm. because accessibility is not considered in goods and services. Mm -hmm. um, so and that's, you know, including websites. So. Right. Um, what is what is APH doing to raise awareness about accessible websites and digital access equity? So last year on Global Accessibility Awareness Day, we put out a blog post, and that's not the only one we've done. We've done other things since then, but that's one example, um, talking about the need to bake accessibility in from the beginning of project planning. So when we work with vendors on our website, we're all we're educating them about accessibility, and we are hoping that they're taking that accessibility knowledge and implementing it into other websites. So we're hoping that as we teach uh, our vendors that we work with, and then also our internal folks that work on the website, um, that they're taking that knowledge and using it elsewhere. Um, that's why we encourage everyone to everyone who's involved in web development to do something like the web accessibility uh, certification, um, so that you can implement you know, the WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, and then also talking about usability. We talk a lot in the community, in all, in all presentations that regard the web, uh, we talk about the need to have usability. Um, you can't just do the accessibility guidelines. You have to actually have blind and visually impaired users testing your website or your app. And that's, very, that's a very important step. And it's one that some businesses, some automated overlay companies and other businesses are forgetting. So we really drill down on that, making sure that um, we focus on usability. And that's something that APH is actively working on. Again, we haven't perfected our system because this abide role is brand new, Yeah. Uh, but we're gonna continue working on getting that, um, getting that usability testing going 
on a regular basis. And we have been doing a lot more of it this year. So I think that's what we do. We just try to talk to every agency that we come into contact with. And also we talk with marketers or other communications professionals about the need to make their websites accessible. We, uh, we had um, the Bluegrass Marketing Association. I can't remember the exact name of it, but they came uh, to a Zoom call and we talked about how they needed to, what the things they could do to make their website and their social media accessible. And someone just beat me to the question. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, that, No, uh, I was going to ask, do you want me to read this? Yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, um, another great question here asking about Braille. So, um, which I'm using right now, uh, full disclosure. So when do you use Braille on your job? And if you use Braille, is it electronic or paper or maybe a combination? And um, what do you think about the length of Braille displays? So, um, you know, do they need to be larger than 40 cells to be more efficient? Um, curious about, about your position on that and what other um, colleagues maybe have found effective. And, um, you know, um, the person who's asking the question personally thinks that a 14 cell display is, is too short because it only fits, you know, a few words and it's not as efficient. So curious to hear your thoughts about Braille. Sure. So I started learning Braille when I was four. I was very fortunate to start learning early. Um, and I encourage anyone to start learning. It's never too late to learn Braille. That's my, my big uh, thing that I tell everyone. It's always helpful no matter where you're at, um, if it's useful to you. And so I prefer, uh, let's see, for work, every day for work, I use Braille. I use Braille every day for work. Um, examples, last week, I took a look at some renderings that were made in Braille of our new building, parts of our new building, that to, to let the people who were making the Braille graphics know that, you know, how they needed to be presented if there was something they needed to do differently. So I'm looking forward to the, the next set um, because as is common, a lot of times when, when sighted people are trying to do those drawings, um, sometimes it doesn't come out in Braille very well because there's too much information. So we have to decide what information do we want and how do we want it to be laid out? And also how are we going to, you know, what, what style are we going to do it on multiple pages and multiple sections and all this kind of stuff. So there's, there's considerations to, to do. So not only do I use it for reading, but I also use it for graphics. Um, at APH, we often have Braille printouts of different things. Um, and in, in its most common form, I use electronic Braille. That's my most common usage. Um, I agree with you on the 14 cell issue, although I do like them for traveling. I like a small display for traveling because it's easier to carry. Um, every day I use a 40 cell Mantis display, which I really like, um, but any 40 or 32 cell display is really good. Um, but I definitely prefer that mid-size display. I, I have never used like an 80 cell because it's so big, it's hard to move it around. Mm -hmm. And I like to use a laptop and be portable. So personally, I haven't used one. I know they're amazing for editing. Like if you have an editing job, it's like the best thing to have. Um, so you can do everything with ease and you don't have to scroll so much. Um, I, I read a lot in Braille and I tend to do the auto scrolling feature. So I don't have to push as many buttons. I think I answered all your questions, but if not, let me know. I'm happy to answer another. I think I, I think I, got, yeah, I, got all of was, the, I think we hit them all right, Katie, for that <laughs> question. I believe so. Yes. Okay. Let, let me follow up with, and Katie, if you have any questions too, feel free to jump in. Um, Please do. Let me ask you this, Ty. So, um, we talked about Braille as one of the things you use on the job. What are some other obvious and maybe not obvious tools as a blind professional that you use on the job uh, to be successful, to be punctual, to be on time, to be efficient? And, and what, what, what does that look like? What does your desk look like or, or your backpack if, we're, if you're traveling? Thanks. Okay. So in my, well, in my toolbox, I'll say it's not there necessarily my backpack, but I, I use an Apple watch a lot. Um, I like to read notifications on my Apple Watch and on my iPhone. I use my iPhone a lot for work. Um, I find some of the, the apps that we use for work, like Microsoft Teams and Paycom, um, the apps are a little less cluttered. So I use the phone for those things. Yeah. I can also use the computer. The websites are fine. Um, and they're, they're definitely navigable apps, but I like to use them on my phone. So I, I really love having my iPhone and my my Apple Watch to keep me on time and to let me know about notifications. I also use a laptop and JAWS for Windows screen reader. Um, I don't currently use magnification because like I said earlier, um, my vision is such that I'm not able to read the print very well. 
well, now I wouldn't be able to read it at all, but um, in the past I was able to read large print. So now I'm doing speech and braille only. Um, trying to think what else I use. Uh, that's pretty much the technology that I'm using. I do have a brailler on my desk. So my desk has a Perkins brailler. Um, I have a slate and stylus in my backpack um, to do labels and short, short things. Like if I need to write a card for somebody or write down my phone number. Um, I carry my business cards in braille. And so APH printed them with, with print on one side and braille on the other. Actually, they might be on the same side. I can't remember actually now, but yeah, um, print and braille on the card. And then I carry my, depending on the travel day, I either carry my Mantis Braille display, which has a full uh, QWERTY keyboard, or I carry a small one, a small display, uh, a chameleon, which is a small uh, 14 cell, no, sorry, 20 cell. So, and I also have, I do have, I do own a 14 cell. I rarely carry that because like we talked about earlier, it's a little small but I do have it for when I really want to be portable on the go and I want to carry a very small bag. Bold, you know, the scene with Braille. That's awesome. Um, and I think you, uh, you might be using a service called Ira for visual navigation. I do. Yes. I use a visual interpreter service called Ira. And so Ira is a service where you can use your cell phone to um, call an agent on a video call and the camera on the back of your phone can be used to have a visual stream to the agent. So you can use that to ask the agent questions about your visual surroundings. So sometimes if I'm doing something that isn't confidential, uh, like traveling or I'm reading, uh, reading a paper or reading some mail, uh, reading something or my computer crashed and I need them to read the computer and help me fix it, um, I can use that. Um, so that's been very useful for traveling through un unfamiliar airports and things like that. And then also reading uh, unfamiliar text. Um, or maybe setting the hotel thermostat or reading bottles in the hotel bathroom or all kinds of things that you can use Ira for. And um, there are other similar services as well, like Be My Eyes that you can use um, for similar, um, similar uh, functionality. Uh, and again, if you have questions, if you're curious, which we hope you are and you want to network with Ty, uh, just drop your questions in the chat or even raise your hand if you want to um, ask a question live. We're, we're here until... Uh, top of the hour, another about 25 minutes. So um, let, let's let's do it. Um, anything else in the chat box, Katie? Not right now. Um, nope. But, do you have any questions? Um, oh, yeah, there's one so from... there we have a question that popped in about access issues. Um, how do you handle access issues when, when you come across them at work? Um, especially if those are needed to get work done. And that was actually along the lines of the question I was trying to formulate in my brain. So thank you for asking that question. That's a great question. So I would typically um, go to the source of uh -oh. someone that maybe isn't accessible. I will contact them and find out where did the form come from? Um, who developed the form? Or you know how can we help with that um, to make it more accessible? So um, I guess I would go to the source of the issue that popped up and then see how we can collaborate together to um, to remedy it. And I always offer my own support to them um, because of my role. Um, I wouldn't I would not expect every blind or visually impaired person or person with a disability to have to do that. Um, certainly, you're not in, you're not required to provide that kind of information to someone. Um, but obviously, if it's part of your job and you really need to be able to do it, it's really helpful if you can collaborate um, to make the situation better for you and others. So um, recently, someone forwarded me a form that wasn't accessible, and I went to the department where it came from and talked to them about how can we make it better. And one of the issues was, well, this came from another company. So then we had to go to the other company and talk to them about making sure that their forms are accessible. So it's an ongoing process of just kind of giving accessibility information and giving people the tools and resources they need to be able to address the accessibility problem. So if it's like a PDF, you know, here are our resources to make PDFs accessible. Um, if you need more help, if this isn't enough for you, um, let me know and I'll try to find some more information and get people in touch. It's a lot of connecting people. I'm a big networker. I like to connect people with the right resources. So it's, it's much of the same. If there's an accessibility problem and we can't solve it ourselves, then we have to find the person who can. You want to use the, do the follow-up question first, Katie? Um, yeah, sure. So 
um, there, to follow up on, on that, we have, um, if, if we don't know, if, if someone doesn't know how to fix an access issue, how might um, we support an inaccessible, the inaccessible source? Okay, so if someone doesn't, are you saying if they don't know who to go to to ask to fix the issue, or is it something different than that? I think so. If if you know if if um, yeah, if we don't know how to how to fix it, or mm -hmm. um, so like know, if how... we don't have this the knowledge to fix it ourselves, I think what what I would do was just try to talk with folks around me and see who might have the knowledge. Um, it's not necessarily true that they would. They might not know that information, especially in an organization that doesn't have a lot of accessibility knowledge. Um, a lot of times I, st I just start with Google, right? If I don't know the answer, I start with Google. I see what I can find, um, you know, inaccessible PDF. You know, how do we remedy that? I mean, certainly I have a list of resources that I can use, but if, if, you, would, if you don't have that, then um, I would say start with your network, talk to them. Um, talk to other blind and visually impaired people or other people with the same disability. Um, talk with uh, anyone else that you can think of, a mentor that could maybe direct you, but also um, Google is really helpful in a lot of these situations. And unfortunately, we're getting a lot more accessibility information on the internet. And that's wonderful because it wasn't, it wasn't there a decade ago. Yeah. And I think we had a few more questions. Come we have, in. yes. Excellent. Our, our audience is. I'm is so engaged. glad. Yeah, me yes. too. Thank you for putting the pressure off me, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have um, some questions here. I'm going to go back to Braille a little bit. Um, so, kind of a question about um, the, you know, portability um, and the the um, weight of mm -hmm. of those. Um, uh, braille displays that they're, you know, would you, you said they're pretty portable and light, Ty, would you say? Yeah, the majority of them, even the larger ones are fairly light. Um, it's just a matter of how much space you have. For example, the Mantis is a very light display because even though it has a keyboard and everything, it has a regular QWERTY keyboard, but it's just a matter of how much space you have. I carry a laptop, so um, I, it would be, I would have to have a laptop and the Mantis and that's a little bit more space. Um, so it kind of depends on what else you're carrying, but they, none of them are more than, well, I don't want to say none of them. I'm not aware of any that are more than like two or three, probably three pounds. Um, most of them are pretty light these days, unless you have a really large one. Um, and those are generally less portable, but they're also designed that way. They're supposed to be plugged into your computer. They're not really meant to be portable as much. Does, I think that's, would you say that's about right, you guys, for, for weight? Probably like three pounds. Yeah, I think the 80 cells get big, big, yeah. or more heavy. Of yeah, course, but I, I, think I the have smaller used an 80 are... cell display. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It, it yeah, and that, of... an 80 cell would be hard to be, it's hard to be portable. It's, it's more of a yes. desktop. Thing. It'd be like a Very suitcase, much. I'm sure. It's <laughs> <laughs> roller yes, bag. But it, is, it is great when you need it. So, oh, yeah, I, um, I agree. I agree. Right. Um, all right. Um, when you use a computer, um, do you um, use the latest JAWS and does your employer help pay for that? That's a great question. So my employer does help pay for JAWS. Um, we have JAWS as well. It's kind of easy for us to get a hold of it, um, which is nice. And um, at home, then I just have a license of my own at home and I just pay the annual subscription. And it's like, I think yeah. it's like $90 or something yeah, like that, that to right, have right. it every year. And then as you do that subscription, it's automatic free updates the whole time you have that subscription. So it can be pretty cost effective. Um, I know they still sell a license where you can pay more and get the license, but then you have to worry about upgrades. So yeah. there are some advantages to the subscription, but it is you know, cost, a cost that you have to plan for every year. Um, so I've started, um, I use uni, uh, an app called you need a budget and I love it because it lets me budget for those things. And it's an accessible budgeting app. Um, and you can use it to budget for things like that in the future. So I'm, I'm a fan of that, making sure that every month I put a little bit away for those different kinds of subscriptions that might come up. Um, and then certain jobs have uh, what is called flexible spending accounts and where you can put money aside from your yes. paycheck. And you can use it for blindness related expenses like JAWS or other things mm -hmm. or your guide dog expenses or things like that. So that's been really handy to put that away pre-tax. So you're not taxed on that money 
and then you can use it to pay for things like that. So if, um, you know, for future, for the future, if you can find an employer with that, it's certainly helpful to have. I think there was another one or two. Yeah, there. we have a couple more if we Great. were ready. Um, yeah. Some, some questions about in the workforce. So sure. a really good question here. How do you, how, um, how do you best sell yourself to a potential employer who might have some reservations about hiring someone with vis vision issues? That's a really great question. I think it's important to talk to them about how you do the job. I'm not necessarily demonstrating how you do it, but just talking to them about your, your, um, you know, your credentials and what you've done in the past and not really focusing so much on blindness and visual impairment. You don't necessarily have to focus that on that the whole time you're talking to them. Um, they should be able to, I think a good employer will, will understand, will know um, by the way that you're speaking about what you've done and your accomplishments that, um, that you can do the job. And I think if they, if they are not listening, honestly, if they don't, if they're not listening to that, then I would be, my, I myself would be hesitant to work at a place where I'm not being heard. Um, and that does happen sometimes, you know, people aren't listening to your credentials and how you do the job. I can tell you, I went into an interview, I, I was in law school and I went into an interview and I was, it was a, for a general practice job in a firm and I was totally qualified to do that job. And all the interviewer could talk about was that I should go into disability law. And, you know, that they were kind of pigeonholing me. And fortunately for me, that's, I did want to go into disability laws. That's what I wanted to do. And I did work as a lawyer for several years, but the point is that nobody should be profiled into doing a certain thing. And so yeah. it's really important to be able to talk about, you know, what has brought you to this point in your career or what has brought you to this point in school and what you've been able to do and how you do it. Um, but not necessarily focusing a lot on blindness and visual impairment. For example, I've done mock interviews with people, with students, and they've talked a lot about their specialized technology um, in a way that was not really understandable to a lay person, like the employer doesn't really understand about a braille note, but they can understand if you talk about the fact that this is like the equivalent of a computer and I can do all of these things. So it's like kind of talking to them in a way that they can understand about how you do your job, but not necessarily focusing on the, the blind technology of it that they might not understand, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Um, along that line, um, on, the, on the tech side of things, um, you know, it, it often seems sometimes when you, you know, go into, go into an interview, um, the employer might have some doubts about how assist, assistive technology, like a screen reader, might work with their databases and software. So what do you recommend saying to that employer? And can you think of maybe some, some free resources that um, could be shared to about accessibility um, with, with that employer? I think it's important to engage in a collaborative process to kind of figure out whether that works because it, I mean, it, it, it is a reality that that software might not work. So it's important to set up a time to come in and test it and um, you know make sure that the screen reader that whatever screen reader you choose can work with that or whatever technology you're using can work with that. Um, unfortunately, that is a harsh reality that a lot of software doesn't work very well. So um, how can you use it in a way that makes you efficient. And a lot of states have um, vocational rehabilitation specialists that can come in and help evaluate that. Um, and I would want to get them involved as early as possible um, so they can come in and see what is needed. Can the software work with the screen reader? Um, if not, can it be scripted? You know, what are the alternatives to make it usable? And if that doesn't work, what are other alternatives that are acceptable? Can um, can you still do the major functions of the job and outsource some of the more technical things that are not accessible? Um, you know, what, what, what employers need is someone who can do the essential functions of a job. And some of those little tasks, some of those may be little tasks that are not essential. So if it's not, I'm only saying that if it's an inaccessible system, certainly if it's accessible, you want to do all the duties. But in a case where it's not accessible, there are ways to get around that. You just have to figure out whether those are essential functions or not. But I think it's important to, to acknowledge like, you know, screen readers are not accessible with everything and let's sit down and kind of evaluate this current situation. Let them know you're willing to work with them on that, not just that it has to be done today and that it's gotta be 100% accessible because that's not reality, unfortunately. Right. I think that was everything, Katie. Yes. 
So let's talk about uh, Ty, um, work-life balance. I know you're not working 24 hours a day. <laughs> what, what does Ty do for fun? I know that you have a bicycle across Iowa and you've done other cool and crazy things. Talk to us about what you do to kind of balance out your work life to have fun. Yeah, so I really enjoy traveling and it's something that a lot of people have anxiety around. Um, and I've just decided that I'm going to go on adventures and if I get lost, well, I get lost, it'll be fun. But I enjoy that. I enjoy going to different cities. Um, I went to, I once went to Paris and I just, when I arrived, I just set up a time to go tandem biking with a group of people I didn't know. It was a lot of fun to go tandem biking in Paris. I've never done that before. Um, so I do enjoy tandem biking. I like, uh, I like training for triathlon races. So, um, triathlons are where you do a swim and then you go up, get on a bike, tandem bike, and then you go for a run. And so I do the swim, um, with a tether. I'm tethered to another guide who's swimming next to me. And then we do the bike on a tandem bike. And then we do the run with a hand, hand or arm tether. Um, some people use waist belts. And so um, I am going to be training again for a half Ironman, which is a 70 mile race. So that's, um, a, it's a mile swim and then a 56 mile bike and a half marathon. So that will keep me very busy training for that because it's a lot of uh, sitting at home training on my bike. I have a bike in my basement that I ride to get trained and then I have a treadmill. So, um, and then I go to the pool for, for training. So that, that keeps me pretty busy. Um, I do enjoy reading a lot and I do like to go to concerts quite a bit. I'm really interested in a lot of different types of music. So I try to go to concerts, uh, when it's safe to do that. And I'm hoping that we get to do that a little more coming up when COVID is uh, less of a concern, hopefully. Very exciting. Yeah, I think we share a lot of passions with travel and things. And are there times where anxiety gets the best of you? And how do you manage that when you're traveling to a new place and it's, you know, just foreign to you in all aspects? What, what you know, how do you get over that to get your, you know, to get to what you want to do? Yeah, I think we all encounter that anxiety from time to time. And I think um, what I had to become comfortable with was asking people around me. I felt like that became essential at times. Um, and sometimes it's not comfortable because you have to like, you know, just hopefully find someone that's available. Like when I'm walking in an airport, sometimes I start to talk to someone and I realize they're on the phone and I had no idea. So sometimes <laughs> it just happens, but you got to try to try to yeah. find someone and get, get some information. Um, and I think the services like be my eyes and Ira have helped with that a little bit because you can get a little bit more information on your own. Um, and then like realizing that everybody gets lost. Like I used to think, oh, that's a blindness thing. No, everybody gets lost. I mean, I know people who are directionally challenged who have perfect sight. So it's kind of like, we just have to kind of accept that that's just kind of a part of life. And I think dealing with the anxiety is um, really important, but it, it is a challenge for us. I'm not, I'm not diminishing that for sure. I definitely encounter that. Um, and I think it helps to talk it out. Um, with other blind and visually impaired people, how do they, you know, how do they get through the anxiety? Like I said, for me, it's like asking questions and getting information, but for other people, it might be different. So I don't want to say my experience is the same as everyone's, but um, certainly kind of getting that support um, from other blind and visually impaired folks about how they travel and what helps them. Um, I think I like to try to prepare as much as I can. I try to get information before I go. Um, certainly it's hard to do that with you know, navigating a new place, for example, but um, just, I just try to get as much information as I can ahead of time when, it, when it's possible. And I like to use different kinds of mapping apps like Google Maps. Yeah. So that makes me feel a little better um, using Google Maps. And I've also found it's really nice to be able to use the Microsoft Soundscape app because you can drop a beacon somewhere. Like for example, if you go off roading, um, certainly you want to have a backup for this. Don't, don't, don't do this, you know, without having a backup plan, but you got to make sure you have a backup in case your battery dies. But if right. you go off roading, you can drop a beacon somewhere and then be, uh, sorry, soundscape will lead you back to that beacon by, by beeping through your headphones. So you can hear how close you are to that particular location. So it does make it easier to say, go walking through a park or maybe go hiking on a trail or something like that. So there are a lot of different ways you can use technology for that. I need to try that. I, I haven't used Soundscape as much as I have, and I use Blind Square and Google Maps together, but I think that's that's a good, you know, we learn from each other, and, you know, that's awesome yeah. because when I go yeah. hiking, I'm yeah. like, yeah, let's try that. Yeah, Soundscape sure. is great. I love it just for learning. Even I just use it in my neighborhood as well just because it gives yeah. me yeah, me too. things that are around. And even just for me, I just like to know, okay, what streets are, you know, what is it? 
the street that I'm approaching or things like that. So, yeah, um, same you here. know, it's good to have all of our tools in our toolbox, right? Similarly, yeah, sure. I use the, um, um, what is it, Un in Blind Square simulated experience where I can go, okay, this is where the store is at. Let me look around from where that store is. And that's kind of cool to go, oh, if I didn't make that store, at least I know what else is around. So yes, yeah, yeah, I haven't tried that very much. I would like to too. use that. I would oh, like it does? That. Okay. Yes. So I I want, I recently went to a larger city and I was using Soundscape and I was using it with my AirPods and it was really neat because Soundscape will mm -hmm. actually like tell you in your ear, like kind of in a directional way, like what's around you. So it'll yes. actually make it sound like it's ahead of you at one o'clock or it's behind you at, you know, whatever, five or seven. Um, so it's wow. really neat that it actually gives you that kind of proximity of where mm -hmm. the, where the thing, and it'll tell you like how many feet it is from you approximately. So I found that really helpful. I've just seen that Sony um, released a pair of headphones that has a hole in the middle. So you can still hear what's going on around you, but it still goes inside your ear. And it's supposed to work really well with soundscapes. So you can hear not only your surroundings, but also what the what your phone is telling you. So that could be a really major game changer for blind people for, uh, for navigation. Let's wrap it up with that last question that we got there, um, Katie. Um, yeah, so we have, um, I think there's two now <laughs> <laughs> there are. So again, just talking about some of those travel apps, um, the accessible ones, um, asking if you're using Apple or Android, um, let's see. I think that those are, I mean, I know that Ira is available on both. Um, I don't know about, I think soundscape might be available on both. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm personally using an iOS device, an iPhone. But um, most of these are, or some equivalent is available on the Android system as well. And do you use any kind of like a Victor Reader track or anything like that? More of a standalone? I have device? used a Victor Stream. I haven't been using it lately just because I'm trying to carry as few devices as I can. Um, yeah. Especially with work, you know, if you have to carry a laptop and then a Braille display and yes. then you're carrying another thing mm -hmm. and then you're carrying your phone, it can get heavy really fast. Yeah. So I tend to use the Bard app on my phone and the Bookshare app. Um, or the, mm -hmm. I guess it was read to go. I think it was, um, those kinds of apps, but definitely I love the Victor stream. I just wish I could, you know, combine all these into one and have a little less weight in my bag. <laughs> right. And just a, a kind of a comment about, um, the, you know, learning about soundscape and, and, um, you know, appreciating what, what all these apps, you know, um, using blind square and soundscape and just making, you know, things you know hiking and trails available to all of us and getting us out there yes. so that's, yeah and I know there are some places that have like accessible trails I know in Vermont they had one where it was like you know there was braille and stuff like that they're not as common mm -hmm. to find but it's really nice when you find one where you can navigate oh, it independently yeah. let me uh wrap it up by asking you this is there a model you live by a motto like a life your your you know your words of life your own mission your own you know um think your own moral compass what do you you know what do you want to leave us with that like what you know you're in closing i think i would go back that? to what i said earlier action conquers fear always i mean even yeah, in, yeah. even in these situations we're talking about about getting lost or you know feeling anxious um just moving forward in some way even if it's a very very small step uh, of you know reaching out for help um and that was something that was hard for me to do reaching out for help um, so I think it's important to take action when you're, when you're fear, when you're fearful. And I also want to leave you with the idea that jobs don't define our worth or value. A lot of what we hear in society is like based on how much money we make or what kind of job we're doing. And it's really important to know, especially from a disability context, because a lot of our mm -hmm. benefits programs are based on like earnings. Um, I just, I just want to leave that with you that it's, you know, they don't define our worth. It's important to have a job we love. Um, but you, you don't have to necessarily have that one passion, that one dream. I, I feel like I have like 10 passions. And so that idea of a dream job, like I have so many dream jobs. <laughs> so don't ever, don't ever feel discouraged if you just can't pick one, because there's always something cool you can do. Um, and your, your path might not be a straight path. Mine has definitely been a very winding, winding road. Hi, it's been a pleasure uh, having you on Career Conversations. For those watching this now, uh, it will be archived uh, very soon. And uh, again, it's great opportunities for job seekers, for people interested in what Abide is all about and who Ty is, is and to watch, to learn, to grow, and, and to share with your, with, your, with your rehab clients or your 
students or anybody just interested. So we, we welcome you to uh, listen to that and to share um, your excitement about career conversations. As I said, in April, we have Kyren Kaja, uh, who works in accessibility over at Instagram. And um, I just want to thank everyone. Ty, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And um, you all come back next month, and we'll do it all over again. Thanks so much.